Okay, so this video is discussing something that Nick Bostrom has brought up in his book, uh, Super Intelligence, which I'm about a third of the way through here. Some of you will remember that I did a couple of videos on artificial intelligence and some of the dangers or potential dangers of discussion of that. Some of the potential dangers of artificial intelligence a, a couple of months ago. And it's with a view to that that I'm reading Nick Bostrom's book. And I have to say I'm a third of the way in and it's looking a very, very interesting book. And the scope of the book is looking considerably wider than I'd expected. I knew that his book talked about artificial intelligence. But what the book really is about is about super intelligence, which is a wider remit. And what he means by super intelligence, he means levels of cognitive function or intellectual capacity that are significantly ahead the, of what we have as human beings at the moment over a wide series of domains. That's how he specifies it. And of course, that could take the form of an artificial intelligence, but it could also take the form of a collective intelligence that perhaps if the ways in which we share information and interact with one another and work in, in collaboration with one another is sufficiently efficient then as a collective we could achieve something which would fulfill those criteria um, without enhancing the abilities of, of human beings and with it simply being human beings working together or human beings and machines working in collaboration as a collective group but he also talks about the enhancement of our own cognitive function the enhancement of our own brains and that was the bit where I found particularly interesting. And it was one of those little moments, one of those little revelatory moments where it was something you'd thought about before and sort of put, put to one side. You'd package and thought, yeah, I've thought about that and put it to one side without really realising the full ramifications of what you're talking about here or what you're thinking about. Because one of the things that I find interesting is what are going to be the next big questions that the, potentially are the big questions that will arise throughout the rest of my life i don't know how much longer i'm going to live I, probably about another 40 years what could crop up in those next 40 years what could crop up in the next 100 years and that's quite an interesting thing to think back and same as you can think of what are the big questions now things like global warming that weren't really such big questions 40 or 50 years Back, but perhaps 40 50 years back you would have clues that they were going to start to become really big questions and so it is the same thing here so what he's talking about in this particular part of the book is genetic technology and using genetic technology on, on germline cells or on embryos to try and, and modify our cognitive function to enhance our cognitive function and I think these kind of genetic technologies most people realize that they're going to play a big part I don't think some people realise how critical these things are going to be, especially when you frame them in an evolutionary context. And let's just put aside, just a, this is an aside, but let's put aside the cognitive enhancement for a bit and just think about the situation that we're getting ourselves in as a species at the moment, which is that under the normal running of things for every single species in the world, the main function of the evolutionary process, and by the evolutionary process I'm referring specifically to the selection process, the natural selection rather than the mutational side of it, is to preserve what is already there. That is the main thing that it does. In fact, if the rate of mutation is sufficiently great, then the whole system falls to pieces. Evolution, the whole process of evolutionary biology cannot work unless the rates of mutations are sufficiently low because most mutations are deleterious. And what we have, I suggest, as a species right now is a situation where the usual mechanisms of evolution are no longer working because the people that would be dying before they were born would be dying soon after they were born would be dying while they were children dying as adolescents dying before they had a chance to reproduce themselves or get to reproductive age but then don't have the mechanism to reproduce because they again have some kind of fault with their reproductive mechanisms there Right, they're still getting to reproduce because modern medicine, the marvel that is modern medicine, is keeping them alive, is allowing them to get to full maturity, allowing them to get it to child rearing age, and then helping them with the process of falling pregnant or carrying a baby full term. 
or feeding a baby when they're incapable of feeding a baby afterwards. Nature is very, very fucking savage. And it prunes out a lot of people, uh, sorry, a lot of, a lot of organisms in very, very savage and cruel ways. But if it doesn't do that, what happens is the whole system goes to shit because everybody has mutations in their genome that their parents didn't have. And a lot of the time, those are not positive mutations, nor are they synonymous or otherwise silent mutations. They are deleterious mutations. And it should be of concern to us if we're in a situation where generation on generation, we are accruing more and more of these deleterious mutations than we're managing. We're accruing them at a greater rate than we are getting rid of them which is the the normal situation that you expect in 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 nature which is that you you're getting rid of these these are being removed these are being refined out of the genome at the same rate in which they're being created and so you've got some kind of equilibrium going on there now if that sounds anything even approaching a clarion call for some kind of eugenics program well, let me stop you in your tracks because that's the last thing that that is I, i'm absolutely delighted that we have these kinds of technologies that have allowed people's lives to be enhanced or allow people to have lives where they otherwise wouldn't have done in the way that has taken place but it does need to act as a kind of a, a awakening that these are the issues that we're going to have to deal with and of course we're already embarking down that road with the kind of genetic screening technologies that we have which are really rather remarkable my wife when she was pregnant last year she, she our baby boy was screened for chromosomal abnormalities without any of the usual methods they did it simply we had to pay a couple of hundred pounds for this but they simply took a blood sample of my wife's uh, and and there is sufficient genetic uh, material of the baby's washing around in the mother's bloodstream that they could extract uh, and isolate that and, uh, and then uh, run the tests on that that's the kind of level that we're getting to now but of course we're talking about methods that are going to go beyond that that will in that, that will include being able to specifically look at particular alleles and swap them out at a particular locus on the genome with something else perhaps to remove a deleterious function or in the case of the kinds of things that Nick Bostrom is talking about to enhance cognitive functions so it may well be that we can start to look at alleles and work out which alleles have these kinds of uh, these kinds of benefits to our cognitive function and i trust that there's nobody watching that seriously doubts that intelligence is heritable after all go back a few million years and we share a common ancestor with chimps if intelligence was not heritable then that would not be a characteristic that could have been selected for and there would be no mechanism by which we could arrive at the situation we're at now where our cognitive function is superior to that of the common chimp and the bonobo our closest cousins so that obviously there are ways in which we can select we know that by dogs of course by selectively bred dogs have we not and we've selected breeds such as the, the such as the golden retriever which are much 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 more intelligent than some of the other very very stupid um toy breeds that we've created so that we know that intelligence is something that is heritable something that we could select for and this is the kind of thing that nick bostrom starts to talk about in ways in which we could select for it you could select for it in terms of just selecting through embryos just you can just encourage a pair and encourage a uh, a woman to produce a lot of embryos and then select the best embryo. You can start to select particular alleles out from individuals or from populations and start to um, inject those particular alleles in that locus in the genome in lieu of the one that's there as an incumbent. You could start to create bespoke alleles and place those within that, that, that enhance cognitive function even further. And he also talks about something I hadn't considered, which is perhaps some form of genetic cleansing. It could be there's a certain amount of noise in the genome. So it's not just a case of specific genes which, which are directly attributable to our cognitive functions, but it could be that there are things elsewhere in the genome that don't really have much of an effect but do have a deleterious effect that could be removed. A little bit like those kind of registry cleaner programs you have for your computer or, or one that I have on my mobile phone now that enhances its working, boosts a bit of the, the memory by removing a few programs that aren't necessarily needed at the time or, or, or what have you. So something along those lines as well. So there are these different processes that we could use. And what he's talking about is a situation perhaps in which 
the kinds of the highest levels of intelligence that we have now right this is the kind of situation that he's envisaging that perhaps could happen in the not too distant future maybe 100 years from now you could have a situation where the technology is there so that the highest levels of human intelligence that we have now would be the average right and obviously the people at the highest levels of intelligence after you've applied some of these technologies would be significantly above that so that is what he's talking about in terms of super intelligence there and i found that really really interesting now he went through the kinds of things that i'd already considered and most of us would have already considered as the kinds of concerns that we would have with this one of those would in terms of a dilemma for our society one of those would be in terms of driving a wedge a kind of class distinction that we don't have at the moment let me first hold my hand up here and say that i'm not one of these people that sees it as some kind of utopian goal that everybody starts off from exactly equal position it sounds good doesn't it but it's a serious imposition of somebody's liberties if i was a millionaire which unfortunately i'm not but if i was a millionaire sure i'd want to spend some of that money on on expensive and lavish holidays perhaps but i'd certainly want to spend some of that money on my little lad's education right why not give him the best possible start in life that i can afford to give him but why should i be punished from that if 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 then down the line my, my boy is told, well, you had that ex extra money invested in your education, so you have to achieve higher scores to get the same university place or whatever. Well, that's just, that, that seems manifestly unfair, that, doesn't it? I just kind of, well, what's the fucking point, anybody investing in anything, if you're then penalised further down the line for it? So I have no problem with people with greater resources being able to invest more in their children. Of course, I don't have a problem with that. But I think there has to be a limit to that. And where it becomes a real concern for me is if we had some kind of process that solidifies that, that sets that in stone in a way that it seems hard to be able to walk back. As it is, we have a situation where you can come from a working class upbringing. And my working class upbringing was quite fortunate because we had quite a lot of books, etc. Some people working class upbringing uh, has, have parents that have a lot less interest in their children and don't have books and things like that in the house. My father was interested in science, such as I had. Um, but, but even then, everybody's kind of coming from the similar, same intellectual start point. So every, there is always the chance that you can book the system and that you can get to university, even from, and in fact, universities are opening up to a greater um, scope of people all the time, so that there is the chance for that social mobility. If you had a situation where richer parents and richer parents alone could pay for technologies genetic technologies for their embryo which would guarantee that their children would have an IQ of 30 or 40 IQ points greater than they would have normally had I think there you're creating a gulf that cannot be crossed right you're creating very much a two-tier um, species there one group of people that that have a, a substantially higher iq there as a result of their social status and then on top of that they have a better standard of education i think that's going a little bit too far that is something that would really start to seriously concern me um, and also you would have this kind of social pressure which is another concerning that perhaps if these technologies existed within our society at first most people a lot of people would think well yeah I'm, I, I'm kind of uncomfy with that right I have some concerns is it really safe down the line what are the longer term ramifications of this I have social concerns with it so I'd rather not do it but you imagine a situation once you start to get a bit of uptake on it that perhaps you can afford it but you think it's morally wrong but then all your friends are having children that are boosted in this kind of way and it could start to look like the kind of unethical thing for you not to adopt the technology because you're effectively then putting your child at a disadvantage where you could perhaps perhaps financially hold yourself hostage because it might actually be costing more than you can really afford but you feel kind of duty bound to spend this excessive amount of money to give your child that start in life. So 
there's that kind of social pressure aspect on it as well and i'm sure that somewhere through the social strata that would happen and people would be mortgaging themselves up to the hilt because they feel they've got to spend this money to make sure their child has this fantastic starting life so those are the kind of concerns that we would have and so if it was funded on a on a nationwide basis then that would be a real problem and even if it was people would have their concerns and it would put people in a very difficult position so I've always been of the thought that well perhaps as a nation we may decide at least to begin with to either limit it to, to, to the a very small effects or to, to, to kind of ban that kind of technology altogether and that's kind of where I was at with it and that's where Nick Bostrom has said a little bit of an alarm bell ringing for me. And I suggest it's probably something that a lot of other people will have overlooked, even though it's mind-bogglingly obvious, really. It's a real slap in the face when you think about it. But I discussed this with my wife on the way home, and she fell into the same pitfall that I did, which was to say, well, yeah, these are the kind of problems, so we probably wouldn't do it. And this is the problem on an international basis, you would end up having to do it. And this is the difference between these kind of genetic technologies applied to cognitive function as applied to anything else is that it has an economic impact. So apply this kind of technology to anything else, to curing some kind of disease. And we could say in Europe, for example, well, we're not going to do that because we're scared that there might be some kind of side effect that we don't know about. So we're going to stick with the disease for now, right, or the potential of the disease rather than applying this genetic cure. In the United States, they may have uh, the religious right might say, well, it's meddling with God's creation. So we're going to block this kind of thing as well. OK, and that isn't really an issue. Some countries could choose to take it on. Some countries might choose not to take it on and it would all sit together. And I think that's kind of how I always envisaged it with these other things. That as a country, we would have some autonomy in this. We could look at it, see these concerns. And if we wanted to, right, we would be able to make that decision for ourselves. Are we going to take this on board? These kind of IQ buffing genetic measures or are we going to decide, no, we, we don't want to. It's going to have too big an impact on our society or we think there might be some hidden dangers. But this is the thing that I hadn't considered, which Nick Bostrom brought to the table, which is the, the, there is this economic argument which is effectively inescapable. That if, a let's say, a large and economically powerful country like China said, fuck it, do you know what, we're going to take it on board. We've got these huge reserves, let's push that back into society and fund this on a wide scale all of a sudden the whole economic game changes because now all of a sudden countries are not producing people at the different sort of levels of intelligence in roughly similar numbers now all of a sudden you have an economic superpower that is producing super intelligent people at a great at a rate that the rest of us can only dream about and they will become economically dominant in a way that the rest of us cannot ignore if we don't want to become economic backwaters if we don't want to effectively become economically third world countries then what do we have to do we, our arms are twisted really now we have to start doing the same thing ourselves it is the only way that we can compete in the kind of global marketplace we have now we're compelled our arms are twisted and that was really something that i hadn't considered and so i don't even know how you start to tackle things like this when you're twisted when your arm is twisted in that kind of way how you even begin to have that discussion because we don't even have the international mechanisms that would hold i don't think that would stop a country going maverick and say no do you know what that technology exists and we're going to employ it and i think that's going to be that's going to lead to a really difficult period where we're almost going to feel duty bound to take on some of these um, technologies I, i'm very certain that some countries won't and some western countries won't initially but the writing will be on the wall and it won't take many years before they crack before their bottle goes and they think fucking hell we're, we're going down a route here where we, we can only afford to go one generation behind it. if we go any more than one generation 
behind on this intelligence arms race we're going to be absolutely screwed we're going to end up in a position that we won't even be able to claw back um it's a it's a frightening prospect i think that i think this is going to become something that within my lifetime and within the lifetime of most people watching this video will become a very 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 big issue uh, around the globe i'm really interested to know what anybody else thinks about this particular little time bomb that I think is lined up for our future. Okay, well, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening to what I had to say on this one. Bye for now.